Good morning, everybody out there on December. This, I don't know where you guys are, but it's like almost 80 degrees here, which is not getting me in the festive spirit. So I'm trying to surround myself with decorations. I miss snow and cold. Being originally from Delaware and moving to Louisiana, it's been a transition to say the least to have hot Christmases. Good morning, James. I hope everybody's comfortable with a cup of coffee for the topic of ankle pain, which is one of my favorite things to treat and discuss and help people with. I am a fellowship trained foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon. What that means is I did five years of orthopedic surgery training after medical school, and then did an additional year of subspecialized training in foot and ankle surgery. Then I was faculty at the Air Force's Training Institute in San Antonio, Wilford Hall Medical Center, and now I'm in private practice. So I see and treat everything. We do a ton of wellness and general orthopedics, but my subspecialty is foot and ankle, and I just love the ankle. And I have a huge um, interest in treating ankle pain and making it better. And we'll describe different features of that in this talk. This is my clinic in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. These are some of the things that we offer, and we try to add services each year or really every couple of months to try to, I guess, make it easier for people to take care of themselves or empower them to take care of themselves in an easier way. The best way to achieve financial health, uh, happiness, family health, and physical health is to stay healthy yourself. And the only way to really do that is preventative and to reduce chronic inflammation and oxidative stress in your system which is a big push for me with my patients um, and with the well theory, which is my natural medicine company. And then the healing soul, of course, which is the flip-flop I designed for heal pain. Again, a natural, healthy way to sort of manage your own pain. So today I'm going to talk about ankle pain and all of the different facets and issues that happen with it and how you treat it from non-surgical to surgical. Um, and even like in some cases, you can sort of self-treat your ankle pain depending. So we'll talk about all that. And hopefully you guys have lots of questions. I kept this talk kind of vague because ankle pain is just such an enormous topic. Um, I'm really just hoping for a lot of questions. But basically, it can be caused by a variety of factors. Trauma is, of course, one reason. So you sprain your ankle, car accident, you fall off a curb. A lot of people after Hurricane Ida here in um, the Louisiana area were falling off of roofs, trying to take care of roofs and cut down trees themselves. And there are a lot of ankle problems after that. So trauma is, of course, one reason I have ankle pain, but that's sort of the obvious reason. Sprains are a type of trauma, but it's sort of a soft tissue ligamentous injury. This is when you roll your ankle when you're playing sports or you're running or you're wearing high heels and you step incorrectly. And then, of course, a fracture. So the bottom picture denotes the left side is what would be considered more or less a normal ankle. And you can see the shin bone coming down, the fibula, which is the thinner bone coming down. That's your outside ankle. List. And then the one that has a little R in the circle with the arrows, that's showing you fractures. So that is a, an ankle fracture. Um, obviously, that would hurt, and you would not really want that. And that needs to be fixed surgically. But there's a lot of things that affect the ankle and cause pain that don't have to be fixed surgically. So I love these 3D anatomic renderings that are available now to us. We never had these when I was in training or in medical school. These images are awesome, and they sort of I'm showing you the ankle here. So the one on the left is looking from behind the ankle. The one in the middle is looking from the outside of the ankle, okay, the fibula side. And the one on the uh, right, my right, right, is the one from the inside ankle, so from this side of your ankle. And it's just showing you all of the complex ligamentous structures that, that hold the ankle together. The talus, that bone between the shin bone and the heel bone, I call it an intercalary bone. It's a bone with... Um, it doesn't really have any muscular attachments. It's sort of just an in-between bone that effectively acts like a ball bearing, if you will, and allows the tibia to move relative to the heel, relative to the foot. It just allows everything to sort of twist around and move almost like a gear, I guess. And the ligaments control that movement. So if you have damage to one of these ligaments, you will have certain pathology and certain pain related to that. And what we do as surgeons is we go in, identify that, and if it can't heal on its own, either with regenerative medicine techniques, physical therapy, certain bracing, et cetera, then we will go in and actually fix those ligaments surgically. So I wanted to show you this picture to show you sort of what happens in clinics. So when you go see a physician like me um, and you get your MRI and they're talking to you and trying to figure out what's going on, this is what we're actually looking at. 
So the MRI on the left, the far left, where the big blue arrow is, is showing you, uh, this is sort of a cross section, like cutting down the leg and looking at your ankle sort of like a slice of bread. And so each slice on the MRI shows us a different region down the foot, okay? And so the one on the left is matched to the one in the middle. The one on the left is sprained, the one in the middle is not. And you'll see the little white arrow on the one in the middle is pointing to that thin black line you see. What that's doing is connecting the fibula, which is in sort of the, I guess we'll call that the eight o'clock position, and it's connecting it to the talus. Now on the left, you, you don't see that thin line, right? You see another little kind of chunk of bone in front of the fibula between the fibula and the talus. That's showing you where a ligament evolves off in sort of a chronic ankle sprain. These are the things we look for. So like if this were my surgical patient, I would know I need to go in there, remove that loose body, smooth that talus down, clean up everything. And then I've got to repair that anterior talofibular ligament, which is why this says ATFL, anterior front, talofibular connecting the talus to the fibula, ligament. Ligaments connect bone to bone, tendons connect muscle to bone. And so if you look on the right, you see the one that says fibula. If you look on that diagonal um, sort of stripe there, that is the ATFL, anterior talofibular ligament. So that is what you're looking at in the MRI if you were looking at slices of that ankle down like a loaf of bread. So that's what we do. We kind of correlate where you hurt to the MRI to you know what your functional issues are, and then we make a treatment plan. So I wanted to go into different reasons that ankles might hurt besides the obvious of sprains and fractures. And this is going to get a bit academic, but I think it's important for you guys to understand that there's a lot more that can go into ankle pain. So I'm going to talk about the fascial attachments and then gait or the, the act of walking and like what actually happens and how everything from the toe to the hip to the back to the head is interconnected. So if you look on the right with the skeleton with the blue lines, these are showing you all the fascial interconnections in your body. There's a series of them that everything is connected to everything else. So you can see here on the lateral line, the bottom right, the hip IT band connects all the way down to the knee, which connects to the tibialis anterior fascia. Tibialis anterior is what lets you pull your ankle up. And then that connects down to the foot fascia, okay? And then around to some of the medial fascia eventually. And the lateral line on the left, you can see it very clearly, all the way from the hip, all the way down to the base of the fifth toe, okay? So you could have a hip problem and it could clearly affect the foot, right? Or you could have an ankle problem at the lateral ankle and it could obviously affect the knee and the hip. Talk a little bit more about that later. But for my purposes, when I see patients with certain types of ankle pain, I'll often prescribe physical therapy that incorporates what we call the kinetic chain or like the low back down because it's all so interconnected and you cannot treat body parts in isolation. Now your insurance company thinks everything's isolated and not connected and a lot of physicians do, but obviously the human body works as a functional unit and the best care, the best evidence-based care treats the body as a whole entity, not as separate body parts with certain, like a lot of insurance companies will say, you only need four weeks of knee physical therapy for this particular problem. I don't particularly believe that, but that's the world we live in. Um, but you can see how that might not be true. So other causes of ankle pain besides those fascial interconnections being um, not quite normal or there being some bit of tight fascia one place and loose fascia another place. Arthritis, obviously, and that can range from osteoarthritis, which we think is now really a disease of chronic inflammation and oxidative stress, sort of a lifestyle disease to lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. And these are, and that's RF is rheumatoid factor, by the way. Lupus and rheumatoid are autoimmune disorders, correct? So these are things where you actually produce antibodies that attack the synovial lining of your own joints. And so you have to control your immune system if you're gonna control that type of pain. And so we often in my clinic will run autoimmune panels and inflammatory panels when we're looking for sources of ankle pain because we don't wanna miss this. We don't wanna call something just basic arthritis and it could be autoimmune because there's so many other consequences of autoimmune that you don't want to miss. You can get blood clots, you can have heart problems, skin problems, um, just generalized muscle pain, et cetera. So, so we don't want to miss that. So we actually look for these things. Instability, which you could have a sprain when you were 10 or 12, we'll say playing soccer, and it may not manifest till you're 40 or 50. You may have subtle instability all along, and then eventually it just gets to the point where the body can no longer compensate for that defective ligament, and that's when you start to have pain. These are the things that MRI I showed you before. That would be somebody like that with chronic ankle pain. 
Nerve-based pain is a huge thing that's missed all the time. All pain is simply your brain telling you that that hurts, right? The brain is effectively a computer that analyzes electrical signals. So like when you touch your skin, you are stimulating certain receptors in the skin that then send an electrical signal that then travels up to the brain and your body interprets that or your brain interprets that as a light touch. Similarly, you have different receptors for pinch, for pinprick, for vibration, for hot, for cold. All of this is electrical signaling. So sometimes the electrical cords themselves or the I guess the interconnections will be dysfunctional. This is common in neuropathy for like diabetics, we'll say. And then you could have nerve-based pain that has nothing to do with trauma, ligamentous instability, fractures, or anatomy. The nerves are just shooting off wrong, and that hurts. So we look for that too. Tight tendon and, and ligaments. So somebody's looked at this, and so there's a couple studies out there. Something like 80 to 90% of Americans have heel cords that are too tight. What's the heel cord? That's the back of your leg, the Achilles tendon. So when that is too tight, it costs, causes a whole host of pain and disability and dysfunction in the ankle and the foot. So that's one of the first things I look for because that's pretty easy to um, manage in physical therapy. And then there's certain surgical procedures that can be done to really take care of it very quickly. And then the biomechanics, and that's when we're gonna talk about the biomechanics of walking and how your ankle really works. So I wanted to show you this picture. It's a little bit gross if you're not used to anat anatomic pictures. This is actually showing you with a real leg from a cadaver dissection what the interconnected fascia around the leg looks like, okay? So it's showing you a hamstring, which is on the inside of the thigh region, showing you the uh, calf muscles going around the foot to the plantar fascia, then showing you the outside calf muscle fascia connecting to the IT band going up the outside of the hip. You can see how it's all interconnected. And if you have, let's say, a tight hamstring or a tight adductor muscle on the inside of your thigh, you can actually have problems in the outside of your ankle just because of these fascial interconnections. Um, so keep that in mind as we talk about gait and everything. The right side is showing you sort of the classic traditional concepts of biomechanics of walking. So when you walk, you heel strike first, then you load the ground. Okay, that's the loading response. That's when you're whole foot is flat on the ground. Then your body kind of goes over your foot to mid stance. So the body weight is moving over the middle of the foot. And then you go to terminal stance and that's when you begin the push off and then you push off or pre-swing. And then that leg will swing through, right? Meanwhile, the other leg's going through this again and it's just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Each one of those movements has an interconnected movement of the ankle to the foot, to the knee, to the hip, to the pelvis, to the lumbar, to the shoulders, to the spine, et cetera, et cetera. And this is why, because it's all connected. So these are what are called the spiral lines, or there's one spiral line show there and then the back line. And you can see that there's fascia from back here, okay, that wraps around and in the lumbar, also around this way, the lumbosacral fascia, down to the IT bands, all the way down to the leg. Why is that there? Because the human body rotates as you walk. Think about it. Every time you walk and you're swinging your hand, your spine's rotating a bit rotating a bit the other way, rotating a bit, rotating a bit the other way. So to manage those rotations, obviously you need to have a tension band and a spiral configuration, right? I mean, anything like physics or any engineers out there will understand this. Human body is maybe the most beautifully designed machine ever. And it's just always amazing to me how perfect it is really when it works well. And um, I love to see people heal themselves naturally and get back to this on their own rather than us trying to slice and dice and fix it in sort of a synthetic way. Obviously, sometimes that's necessary, i.e. when there's a fracture. But really, we try to focus in my clinic on these kind of concepts to try to get people functionally improved by fixing the kinetic chain and the connections to the spine. So the kinetic chain is important, the spiral lines are important, and obviously what the hip does affects what the knee does, affects what the ankle does. The old song is true, the hip bone's connected to the knee bone. It's very, very true, and it's very important, and it's always forgotten by most providers, I think. So here we are, we already talked about the stance phase and the swings phase, just wanted to refresh your memory. So, Ankle pain at initial contact, so that heel strike portion, right? So remember I told you that the heel cords are tight in 80 to 90% of Americans? So that's going to affect the dorsiflexion or plantar flexion of your foot. So think of this as your shin bone and this is your foot. Dorsiflexion, toes to nose, plantar flexion like ballerina, okay? 
You have to have a certain amount of dorsiflexion when you heel strike to properly walk. And then you have to be able to plantar flex enough to get foot flat to get to that mid stance phase where your body can go over. Your body's not going to be able to go over your ankle without the ability to dorsiflex. So a lot of people with tight heel cords walk like a duck. And you may know someone like this, where they sort of walk with their feet to the outside. Why? Because they don't have enough ability in their heel cord to heel strike foot flat toe off and bring their body over their own foot because the heel cord's too tight. So the compensation is to rotate the foot out or externally rotate. So some people have knee hyperextension. That means it bends backwards or double jointed, goes the other way. That is going to cause ankle pain when you're walking because it will affect how much your ankle has to plantar flex when you're walking. If you lack hip flexion ability or you lack hip extension ability, it's going to dramatically affect ankle pain. So normally the hip should be flexed about 30 degrees when you hit that initial um, contact for heel strike. The knee is supposed to be extended and almost to neutral, but not hyperextended. And then the ankle should be neutral, meaning 90 degrees, the foot relative to the tibia at that initial heel strike. And then you heel strike and you begin to walk through. And obviously the knee's going to flex a little bit. The hip's going to move a little bit and the ankle's going to move a little bit. Some ankle pain is because you have tight hips. I see that all the time. So we always check the hip motion and how tight your hip flexors are and the rotators of the hip. And sometimes physical therapy geared towards that will actually make your ankle feel better. So. Poor control of pronation and supination or a weak foot. So that's when you heel strike and your foot drops in or gets flat, okay? If you have no foot strength, which again is a lot of Americans, uh, if you have no foot strength and you allow yourself to drop in, that affects how your shin bone rotates, which then goes up to the hip and the spine. And that alone can cause ankle pain. Uh, a weak ankle, think of it that way. So people with weak muscles that cross the ankle will have ankle pain when walking, running, or just even standing at work. Tight Achilles, we already talked about that. And then the arthritis, obviously that's a source of pain when you're walking. No quad control, meaning your quadriceps. So the big muscle on your thigh, if that's weak or not um, coordinated properly with gait, when you hit that initial heel strike and you're supposed to be in that little bit of knee flexion, but not much, and you shouldn't be in any hyperextension, as you go over, you can buckle, meaning you can almost give out with it if your quad is weak, because it has to really control how your knee moves from that initial heel strike through to push off, right? So if you got a weak quad, you buckle, obviously that can cause ankle pain. And then some people will lurch, like lurch to the side when they're walking because of knee arthritis is one of the main causes. And guess what that causes? Ankle pain. And then the other problem's true. Ankles that are weak and allow you to have that lateral thrust can in turn promote or exacerbate knee arthritis and knee pain. This is all very much linked together. A Trendelenburg gait, you might be wondering what that is. That's when you see people walking and they take a step and their whole body tilts over their foot. They have to do that because their hip is so weak. And if they don't do it, they're going to fall over because their hip muscles aren't strong enough to keep them upright with gravity when they're in single leg stance. All right, so here we are in mid stance. So the hip should be extending at this point. So remember, you're over your foot and you're going forward. So assuming your knee is straight and your ankle has enough dorsiflexion, your hip should be extending to the back, okay? If you don't have right good hip motion or you got a tight hip flexors, that's going to mess everything up, cause ankle pain. If you have terrible Achilles um, excursion or you have a too tight of an Achilles, it's going to cause ankle pain. And if you don't have enough motion in your great toe, this is going to be a problem. So a lot of people have arthritis in their big toe or a very tight plantar fascia. And so when they go over their foot, their big toe can't bend to accommodate the body going over the foot. That will cause ankle pain, believe it or not. Why? Because again, you have to rotate to the outside to go over your foot. So even something as simple as big toe arthritis can translate up to ankle pain, knee problems, plantar fascia, hip problems, because of all those interconnections and the interconnections of biomechanics we talked about. Hip extensor weakness, the biggest hip extender is the gluteus maximus. So if your gluteus maximus is weak, which it is in a lot of people, you don't have enough strength to extend your hip properly. And that will at cause abnormal gait and biomechanics. And then again, probably the number one reason is a tight heel cord that doesn't allow your ankle to dorsiflex as you walk. All right, so a normal decent stride length 
will have ankle pain when your dorsiflexion is limited. So if you're trying to walk normally, but you have a tight heel cord, your ankle's going to hurt. So that's why that's one of the first things we look for. And then the hip has to be able to extend a certain amount. It has to be able to rotate a certain amount to allow for normal walking. So the second thing I look for with ankle pain, you know, after x-rays and ruling out the lupus and rheumatoid, et cetera, is hip motion. So heel cord motion, hip motion, hugely important sources of ankle pain. And then you can have a short stride, like you can maybe not take the normal length of a step, which is what stride is, okay, stride length. You may look normal, but your stride length is short. So we often watch people walk. If they have a very short stride length, that's sort of a sign that they're protecting themselves or guarding, and it's all subconscious. It's all become a reflex at this point. But that's a sign that something's not right with the biomechanics. And then that, of course, is something we can treat non-operatively, which is great. All right, so pre-swing, okay, remember this is right before you finish pushing off and you're sort of propelling yourself forward, right before you're about to swing through. Swinging through requires that you're able to pull your foot up to clear the floor so you don't stub your toe. That uses the muscle in the front of your shin, where if anybody in the audience has ever had a shin splint, that's your tibialis anterior. So if your heel cord's too tight or you've got a weak tibialis anterior, you will start to have pain during that pre-swing phase. This comes out more often in running, okay? That's why shin splints normally happen in running, but hugely important for swing. And then, of course, if you've got ankle arthritis, which limits the motion of the ankle joint, particularly in the front of the ankle joint, that's going to really mess up your transition from push-off to swing. And you'll have to lift your hip up or circle your leg out to clear the floor. And again, poor, great toe motion. Such a simple little thing. I mean, that joint is like maybe this big, can cause problems everywhere. All right, so that was sort of a primer on gait. Um, and don't worry if that was a lot of information. It's a lot of information for everyone. This is on the orthopedic in-training exam, the annual assessment of orthopedic residents every year. And they have to learn it every year. And Surgeons have to learn all the time. It's a very difficult concept, but hugely important, as you can see, in terms of why somebody might have pain in a particular joint and how it can be treated and managed non-surgically if possible. So what do you do if your ankle hurts at home? Rest is always used initially by doctors, but too much rest is obviously not optimal for health. So we don't want to overly rest something. And in fact, people that are known to be totally inactive versus people that are very active, the inactive people actually degenerate their bone and cartilage faster than others because the body needs the impact and the mechanical stresses and motion to maintain its integrity and function. So rest short term, that's good, but long term, not so good. So if you find that you're having to rest your ankle for like weeks, probably you need to go see a physician. Ice is awesome for any injury, obviously, and really any pain. Ice is one of the most natural, safest way to reduce pain and reduce swelling. Obviously, you don't want to put it directly on your skin and get frostbite, so please don't take that as any sort of advice there. But ice used judiciously with a thin layer between the skin and the ice is very, very helpful. Compression, awesome too for any kind of pain. Why? For a couple reasons. Compression makes the muscles more efficient, okay? So you're encapsulating all the muscles in an, another layer of, I guess, restraint. This is why you're seeing all the professional athletes, particularly basketball players, seem to be covered up in compression devices. It's because it gives them that 1% to 2% more efficiency in the muscles, makes them stronger and faster and perform better. The other thing compression does for you is it stimulates the deep pressure fibers, which actually overpower the smaller nociceptive pain fibers. So that's why like if you get a paper cut and you press really, really hard, you don't hurt as much. It's because the pressure fibers are bigger. And again, those electrical circuits overpower the smaller pain circuits. And so the brain only feels pressure. So compression is a great trick too. Ice and compression is awesome. Again, most insurance companies won't pay for this, but that is a great method to treat pain. And then elevation just to help swelling. We have a question. Okay, the question was, what is the safe way to push yourself through the initial pain in order to be more active? I mean, if you have a fractured ankle, I think you're going to probably know that you can't do too much on it because it won't be able to hold you up, right? But let's say you just have arthritis pain or let's say you just tweaked a little ligament or you have a, you tore a calf muscle. You would do your initial RICE, RICE, rest ice compression elevation protocol, which is 
what all athletic trainers for every professional team in the world does, maybe some topical pain medications. Um, and then when your swelling went down, you might want to take some anti-inflammatories briefly as well. Although I'm not a huge fan of those because they do slow down tissue healing. Um, but in, in cases they are important. Anyway, you go through your initial one to two days of rice or rest ice compression elevation, depending on your age, you know, like 16 year olds, you can get away with maybe one day of that and then start to ease into things. People in my age group, it might take two or three days. And then you just kind of, let's say you're a runner. Instead of running, you would walk and then lightly jog to see how it feels. If that hurts, you back off and just walk. And then if the jogging doesn't hurt, you would walk a little bit more, add a little bit more. Most professional athletes add only 10% a week to their schedules of activities. So you can kind of sort of think in those terms. Um, but if you find, let's say your heel striking and you constantly drop to the outside and it hurts, that's kind of a sign of really pathologic instability. Those are the times you need to go get seen because you might need a brace, you might need taping, um, you might need physical therapy. But for my purposes, I've torn my calf muscle before running on the beach barefoot, not the smartest thing in the world because I was really out of shape when I did it. What I did was I used a heel lift for a while and compression. And after about a week, it started to feel better. And then I eased into walking and then very slowly over the next two weeks brought back in running and it eventually healed itself. So basically just common sense is the easy answer there. A mindset for inactivity? It, there's a question, is there a mindset to be active? Yeah. So our country and, you know, a lot of the problem is physicians, okay, because they've for years told people if it hurts, don't do anything and sit on the couch, which is maybe the worst advice in the world because there's no literature that supports that except for the obvious case where you actually have a broken bone. So I think what happens is a lot of people, when you tell them to exercise, they think, oh, I got to go join CrossFit or I got to train for a marathon or I need to be a power lifter. It's not true. Most of the data in the literature, and I'm talking about tons of data in literature from human evolution through now shows that you really only need to walk three or four times a week and maybe do some muscle work or strength two times a week. So for people that are scared of being active, I mean, literally just getting and walking around the block, start with that, or even half of a block uh, once a week. Then when they get used to that and realize, wow, I felt really good after I did that. Then they add a second walk that week. Okay. That, wow. That really feels good. Then maybe you stretch a little bit and you just, I think once people begin to move, you can't help but feel better because guess what? The human body was meant to move. So it's going to feel terrible when it doesn't move, obviously, but it seems not obvious to a lot of doctors. And I don't know why you have movement is the way to optimal aging and best health. And so I think people that are scared of it or intimidated, um, you just have to think of the simplest thing in the world. I mean, I'll tell people, look, why don't you just try to park not at the first closest lot at the grocery store? Why don't you just try to find a far away parking spot? And then that makes you exercise at least once a week. It's not a lot, but it gets them started. We call that opportunistic exercise in our world. Or maybe take the stairs for one flight at least, not the elevator all the time those kind of things, just ease into it. And most people begin to feel the benefits and then they feel better and they're just gonna do it on their own. All right, so when should you see a doctor? We talked about fracture, we talked about swellings not going away, you've been icing it, elevating it, it's been three days, four days, it's still really swollen. I will tell you, remember the most basic science will tell you the maximum amount of swelling is usually day three after an injury. So you can sort of expect that. Uh, so if by day four or five, the swelling's not down, it's you probably got maybe a bigger problem. Um, obviously, if you have a fracture where the skin's broken, you know, an open fracture, you need to be seen. Ankle sprains that have bruising all the way up and down the leg, those tend to be a little bit more significant and you might want to go get seen pretty quickly. And actually for ankle sprains, most people blow these things off. They're like, oh, it's just an ankle sprain. I'm not going to worry about it. But the literature is pretty clear that the people that get into guided physical therapy for what we call early functional rehab early, like within a week of the injury, they have the best long-term outcomes. So they're less likely to see a doctor six months later or so. So if you think you have an ankle sprain, call up your physical therapist and get seen. We have direct access in our state. You don't even have to see a physician. Um, I mean, I'm happy to see you, but I'd rather you get treatment than do nothing 
similar things in other states. But so if you think you have a decent ankle sprain, I would go get seen and get into a guided physical therapy program because you will do better long term. All right. No, that's good. Go ahead. So when to see a doctor. So, all right. So you have, let's say you have a car accident and you broke your tibia. You had surgery. That all healed. You, you, but you were up, you were off the leg for, let's say, three months. You did a little bit of PT, but it was all focused on your knee. Then you start walking nor what you, you think is normal. And then you notice your ankle hurts. Well, in those cases, I would probably go see someone because the that is when things are missed during trauma. So what we call these in orthopedics is distracting injuries. So you might have a femur fracture, a tibia fracture that is so painful and everybody's brain is focused around that, that any other minor injury is completely missed. I see it all the time. So if you have trauma and you have late ankle pain or foot pain after a big traumatic incident, I would go get seen because you don't know what, what's been missed. Ankle pain associated with instability. Something like 40 to 60% based on the literature of ankle sprains have another associated ankle injury that was missed at the time of the sprain. Anything from a cartilage tear to a syndesmosis or high ankle sprain injury like, like the Alabama quarterback had, those get missed all the time, believe it or not. To a midfoot sprain, these things are always missed. So if you have instability and you had an old sprain that was treated, but you continue to have like weird pains that don't make sense, you might have an associated injury and need to be seen. Burning pain, that's the nerve-based pain. A lot of times there is no way to manage that on your own, so you probably need to be seen. Night pain is always concerning to us. Night pain is when things like tumors and other types of obscure sources of ankle pain manifest. So I would go get seen if you have consistent night pain. Locking, popping, or catching an ankle, like it's whenever you move it, it catches or there's some weird sound or pops, sometimes that's a sign of a loose body rolling around inside the ankle. Obviously, you're not going to be able to self-treat that, so you probably need to go get seen. If you're worried about infection at all, obviously, or God forbid, a spider bite or anything like that, please go get seen. And then if you're limping and you just don't know why, because remember I showed you the spiral lines and those kinetic chains? A limp can mean anything, so I would go get seen. All right, so ankle arthritis. Let's talk about this for a minute. So there's a million ways to treat ankle arthritis from pain pills to doing nothing, right? And anything in between. I prefer regenerative medicine techniques because although most insurance companies still consider these experimental, therefore they don't have to pay for them, uh, regenerative techniques are to date the only thing that has even a remote chance of getting cartilage to heal itself. So what the pictures I'm showing you on the top, the left is an ankle replacement surgery, which I do. These are great surgeries for end stage or ankle arthritis that is beyond being able to tr be treated with regenerative medicine techniques or anything else. We actually do ankle replacements, just like people get knee replacements and hip replacements. Ankle replacements are a great surgery. It, they, they had a bad history years and years ago, but the technology has improved dramatically. The results are awesome. The implants last 15 to 20 years. I love doing ankle replacements because everybody that gets them is so happy afterwards and they're still able to walk normally, as opposed to those that have ankle fusions, which is the other option for end stage ankle arthritis. That's when you actually connect the ankle to the talus. It eliminates the pain, but it also eliminates normal motion. Remember I showed you all those spiral lines and how everything from the big toe to the hip is connected and matters? Well, think about if your ankle doesn't move at all. Think about how that's gonna mess up that whole cycle of gait and biomechanics I showed you. So I don't like to do fusions unless it's absolutely the only option for somebody. So these are your two surgical options for end-stage ankle arthritis. But for my purposes, for early arthritis or people that have decent amount of cartilage less, left, I have long conversations about all of the regenerative options out there from connective tissue matrix injections, which are actually derived of amniotic tissue after a live birth. The amniotic sac, which is normally thrown away after a C-section, can sometimes be reprocessed and used with the mother's permission for a medication. They've been using this in eye surgery for forever and then in orthopedic surgery for nearly as long. Now we can actually offer it as an injection for a lot of people. Um, Sometimes you have to be on anti-inflammatory med. Let's say you have lupus. Let's say you have um, rheumatoid. Maybe you have to be on Humira or Enbrel. Who knows? But you need to get that diagnosed. Um, the connective tissue matrices and the things like platelet-rich plasma and other regenerative techniques have growth factors. Okay, these are things that actually promote um, reduction in pro-inflammatory or catabolic responses, reduction in proteins that damage uh, cartilage. These are called proteases. They're actually like enzymes that go in and chew up good cartilage. And then they have pro-healing and uh, 
factors, growth factors like platelet-derived growth factor, things like that. Um, and these are all natural, drug-free, not synthetic, and very, very safe versus steroid, which personally I am not a fan of steroids because of the massive amount of tissue damage they actually cause. But again, steroids are cheap, so they're totally covered by all insurance plans, and most insurance plans will tell you that's the first tier treatment you should do. But if you look at the data on steroids, the long-term um, outcomes in people is not so hot. So I try to avoid those unless it's the absolute only option for someone. And then uh, there's other injections you can do, like hyaluronic acid, which, again, not covered by insurance for the ankle. Tordol you can do. Platelet-rich plasma we talked about briefly. And then stem cells, uh, which are awesome, um, but totally not covered by insurance and pretty expensive, but very, very good for early arthritis, in my opinion, based on all the literature I've read in my experience. Uh, but again, considered experimental by most payers. And then what if you have a severe bad sprain? What if it doesn't get better with physical therapy and you continue to have that persistent instability and lurching we talked about when you're walking and now your knee hurts and now your hip hurts, you can't play sports, you're having trouble at work. Well, these are the cases where sometimes we have to go in and surgically fix it and we do ligament stabilization. And these are two anatomic pictures showing you sort of the process I do. I use um, an implant made by uh, one particular company called Arthrex and they actually put an internal brace into the distal fibula. And so you embed into the bone this piece of fiber tape that you then embed into the talus. And it basically recreates that torn anterior talofibular ligament that we talked about. And it gives you awesome stability right away. So in my hands, a surgery for ankle instability, I can have people weight bear, if not immediately, within a week after surgery. So that's been a game changer in terms of technology. But basically, if you remember those anatomic pictures I showed you, you actually go in and repair that ligament and tighten it to the fibula. And that bottom picture is showing you the suture anchors embedded in the fibula bone and sort of that yellow curved band of fiber there, the ATFL is embedded within that. And so you bring that up to the fibula and tighten it up. But remember, up to 60% of ankle sprains have associated problems that are not initially diagnosed. So for my hand, in my hands, I always scope the ankle or I do arthroscopic surgery to look around and test the cartilage and test other ligaments. And we do a few other things to look for these associated treatment um, injuries and then we'll treat them at the same time. So ankle sprain, early functional rehab is the number one best way to treat it. But if that fails, you do this surgery, which is the internal brace I told you about. So foot strength, remember we talked about foot strength, how important that is for the kinetic chain when you're walking and running. If you have decent foot strength, you can actually improve this whole list of things. Your balance will be better, okay? Single leg stance and walking and running. Your speed will be better. You'll be able to carry and push loads, so your performance at work will be better. You'll be able to react to any change in the surface. So let's say you're walking along a smooth road and then suddenly it turns to gravel. People with weaker feet and ankles, they can't manage that and suddenly they fatigue, so the muscles get really, really tired and then they start to have pain and swelling. Your walking speed gets better. And guess what's associated with dementia as you get older? Change in walking speed and change in biomechanics of walking. So the people that lose walking speed quickest and walk abnormally, that's actually a signal to neurologists that dementia is coming. But training your foot, training your ankle, you can actually enhance your mind-body connection. And by exercising and getting your foot and ankle stronger, walking more, you can actually improve cognition. A strong ankle, better balance, strong foot, guess what? That also helps with. You're not going to fall as you get older, or you'll reduce your risk of fall, I should say. That's why things like Tai Chi, which I tell people all the time to do, or yoga, are awesome for fall prevention because it makes your ankles and your feet so strong and also improves balance at the same time. And then again, and you already know this because we talked about it, if your ankle and your foot are strong, guess what else is going to feel better? Your knees and your hips. So if you got a weak ankle, your knee is never going to feel right because it can't. You've got to have everything running optimally. Do I have a resource for developing the proper stride? Um, beyond just the basic science of what your foot's supposed to do at initial heel strike, mid stance, push off, I think the best thing to do is go get what's called a gait analysis. And there are people that will actually, they'll put sensors all over your body and put you on a treadmill and film you so that they can sort of in a, in a very scientific way analyze how you walk 
and then make any corrections as needed. But basically, the normal stride is kind of what we talked about. Your hip's supposed to swing through enough that your heel can strike the ground with your ankle dorsiflex. You're supposed to have enough knee and quad function and hip flexibility to swing over. Then you have to have enough hip strength and extension to push off in addition to the ability of the ankle to dorsiflex and then have enough strength to push off. Meanwhile, your foot goes from heel inverted to everted. Your midfoot goes from neutral to pronated to neutral to to supinated, and then you go from a lateral strike on the fifth toe to pushing off on your big toe. So I think if you think you have an abnormal stride, start with a physical therapist or a physician to um, sort of watch you walk. And if you can't get good answers there and get training on your gait, then you have to go get a formal gait analysis. That's what a lot of elite runners do. So this is an image from um, not my website, a different website. This gentleman had that connective tissue matrix injection in his ankle. Um, but the important part I thought in this whole sort of advertisement for that was his post-operative, and this guy's in his 70s, by the way, was his post-operative ankle rehab. So strengthening the ankle after you have those sort of regenerative injections is extremely important. And that's when you're going to get the great results that let you start hiking and keep hiking into your 90s. Okay, I mean, people do this all over the world. It's just in America, we've been taught to eat terrible food and to be inactive, which is really not optimal for aging. So we try to promote the opposite. Oh, I got a long question. Hold on. Can I ask you, I have mild midfoot arthritis. Ma I have lapidus and akin osteoporosis. Akin. Okay, so somebody had midfoot arthritis and they had a lapidus, which is a fusion of the first metatarsal tarsal joint and an Aiken, which is just a phalanx osteotomy. So far so good, but I worry that they didn't fuse other parts of the foot because I had some pain in the middle of the foot as well, as well as on the outside of my foot prior to surgery. Okay, so this person had a fusion of the medial column, but they're worried they're going to continue having pain because none of the other joints were fused and they had lateral pain pre-op. So they're worried that all of that needed to be fused. I would say this, the fewer joints you fuse, the better. Lapidus, okay, that procedure is usually done for a bunion deformity, especially a lapidus with an Aiken. So I would have to imagine this person had a preoperative bunion or hallux valgus. And what that does is it actually, that deformity will change the biomechanics of how you're walking because the medial side or the side of the big toe actually elevates and becomes in, incompetent and people tend to laterally overload. So you have lateral pain when you have a bunion. So sometimes by fixing the bunion, you can actually improve that lateral pain like it takes care of itself because now you're going to heel strike and push off through the big toe, whereas before with a bunion, you would heel strike and push, push off more with the second, third, fourth, fifth toe. So that's probably, I'm guessing, what the, what the theory of the surgery was or the indication. So I think you should be okay with just the lapidus if I'm guessing right as to the indications and why you were hurting before. Can you use PRP injuries and ankle sprain? So this question is, can you use PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma, to treat an ankle sprain? Yes, I do that a lot. So what PRP is, is you take your blood, about 15, 20 cc's, and then we centrifuge it. And there's different protocols for that. The whole purpose of centrifuging is to separate out the red cells from the white cells. The white cells hold the platelets. The platelets hold all the healing factors. So by concentrating the platelets, thus platelet-rich plasma, so you have a lot more platelets than you normally would, and you inject those back into the injured tissue, it brings all of those growth factors. And then there's even an autocrine function of PRP where the PRP will actually send out chemotaxis signals, which is chemical signals, and they'll actually bring in any surrounding stem cells to help it heal up. So I think PRP is a great way to treat ankle sprains. If you were a professional athlete, there'd probably be no question you would get PRP no matter what. Um, but again, it's not covered by insurance companies. So a lot of physicians don't think about it. They don't mention it. Um, but it can be done. We do it in our clinic all the time. And I think that's a great way to treat an initial ankle sprain. If you want rapid recovery, you don't have to do it. You're still going to heal most likely. But if you want a quicker recovery and a more robust recovery, I think it's a great adjunct. We have another question, sorry. Um, is the AMA lobbying to get hyaluronic injections for ankle pain? 
So this question is, is the AMA, the American Medical Association, lobbying for hyaluronic acid injections for ankle pain? The short answer is no. In fact, um, I don't know what's going on with the medical so societies, but a lot of their clinical guidelines, particularly my society, are very much, um, I don't want to say poo-pooing hyaluronic acid, but they're certainly not robustly for it. And that's even for the knee, where it was initially FDA indicated. So I'm going to say probably not. Um, the payers seem to hold a lot of power in this world. And of course, they say there's no double blind placebo controlled studies, but of course you can't do those because you can't get funding for them because it's not covered. So it's sort of a self-feeding cycle. The American Medical Association doesn't really advocate for any particular subspecialty in terms of a particular product. That would be more the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. And I can tell you emphatically that they're not doing that. I wish they were, because it's a great option. This question is, have I seen any success with my tart cherry and joint health? Short answer is yes. Of a lot of people that when they get on tart cherry and the turmeric ginger combo we have, a lot of their ankle pain just gets better and goes away because that treats the core foundational problems that arthritis causes. And we're talking about people with ankle arthritis, obviously. So the core sources of pain are inflammation and oxidative stress with arthritis. So if you can manage those two um, cellular level damaging processes, then your pain will get better. And so PEA, this is another one that we have, palmitoyl ethanolamide, that's in the same family as anandamide, which is also called the bliss molecule, which is what CBD and THC upregulate, okay? So PEA is in the same family. PEA is produced by your body and my body every day on an ongoing basis. Anytime you have any sort of thing that makes a nerve, um, hyper excitable or inflamed, PEA is produced to calm that down. So PEA is an awesome way to treat inflammatory pain, particularly around nerve endings. And then tart cherry is an amazing antioxidant and also an anti-inflammatory, very strong. And then of course, quercetin, another great antioxidant, also great for joint health. Vitamin C, people forget. Vitamin C is an awesome small molecule antioxidant, okay? So it chews up the damaging oxidative stress but it is also a mandatory cofactor for the cross-linking, the appropriate cross-linking of the collagen. So a lot of people drink bone broth and take collagen, right? But they're not taking vitamin C. Well, for your body to break down and use those amino acids and make your own collagen for cartilage, bone, tendons, and ligaments, you have to have a good amount of vitamin C. So try not to forget to take your vitamin C too. It's massively healthy for you. And then D3, plays into everything. D3 really functions more as a hormone in the human body as opposed to a vitamin. Um, so don't forget your D3. That will actually also help arthritis pain. So a lot of people that have pain, they've done big population-based studies. A lot of people with chronic pain have low vitamin D3. And when you supplement them, they start to feel better. So all of these things matter. And most physicians are going to poo-poo it and tell you it's crazy and put you on ibuprofen and steroids. But the basic science literature for the cellular level, the steroids and the anti-inflammatories ultimately cause damage to the human body versus the natural things which ultimately help the body heal. That's my philosophy, and that's why I'm a big proponent of this. Okay, we have some more questions. My experience with my Christianity about a year ago, got the flip-flops, it helped, the pain uh, was better, but now most of the pain seems to be along the top of the foot and in my ankle. Feels like my sock is punched at the front of the foot, and the pain has turned mostly into discomfort. I'm walk home, and most of the time. Okay, wow, that, is, that's a long question. What is it normal? Yes, the question is, is that normal? Okay, that was a long question. Chuck. Okay, Chuck, let me see if I can get this right. You had plantar fasciitis. You got the flip flop. That he's talking about the healing soul and a help, but now you've got pain in the top of the foot and the ankle, and it feels like a sock is bunched up under the toes, I'm assuming, the foot pad. So whenever somebody tells me they have a sock bunched up under their ball of the foot, that area, that usually means nerve pain, because nerves, they don't always burn. Sometimes they feel like there's a balloon inflated. Some people feel like they're stepping on a stone. Some people use the words you use where they feel like a sock is bunched up. Some people have electrical things. And then if you're having top of the foot pain, 
fall of the foot and ankle pain, I, if you were my patient, I would start looking at your nerves. I would look at your tibial nerve, your superficial perineal nerve, and then all your plantar digital nerves and make sure you don't have some competing issue going on. Um, if your plantar fasciitis got better, we have to assume that the plantar fascia is now working in sort of a normal mechanical way. That sounds almost nervous to me. This is a great question. Somebody asked if they wear an ankle brace for too long after an injury, will it weaken the ankle? And the short answer is yes. So bracing is providing external support to the body to replace or enhance what should be happening inside the body. So an ankle brace gives you external ability to not roll your ankle, right? Because your ATFL is incompetent. But if you use an ankle brace for too long, just like people that use wrist braces or back braces for too long or for the wrong indications, you actually can get weak and you become dependent on these. I see this all the time with inserts, orthotics for shoes too. That's why my healing sole doesn't really do anything to correct alignment or have any kind of major arch support because ultimately it's bad for your foot. It weakens your foot. Your goal should be to get as strong as possible. So let's say you're in an ankle brace and you've been in one for a while and a physician puts you in it and you're not getting better. I would go see a physical therapist or get a second opinion because you're right. Ultimately, it will weaken you. How many people have you seen walking around with neck braces for four months at a time? None, right? Well, there are some, but generally speaking, no. And because it's terrible for you. You don't want a weak neck flopping around. The same thing's going to happen to your ankle and your foot. This question was, how is CBD anti-inflammatory or how does it enhance THC, I guess, in its anti-inflammatory capacity? So this is a whole nother lecture we did, which I'm happy to do again at some point. But CBD and THC are uh, ligands or they are um, molecules that attach to receptors in what's called the endocannabinoid system of the human body. The endocannabinoid system is the biggest system of receptors, and it is ubiquitous throughout the body. It is everywhere. CB, the CB1 receptors are predominant in the brain, and the CB2 are predominant in the immune system and the external, you know, the periphery of the body. THC will attach mostly to CB1, and, and then the CB2 is regulated more by CBD. Okay? So what does the endocannabinoid system do? It's effectively the regulator of every other system. Eat, sleep, relax, forget system, we call it. So if your endocannabinoid system is not running optimally, your other systems are allowed to get too hot or too cold. The endocannabinoid system is sort of like the central processing unit that keeps everything kind of even keel because the body likes to be Goldilocks. It just wants it just right. You don't want too much of anything. You don't want too little of anything. So a lot of people are what we call endocannabinoid deficient, and that's why CBD and THC work so well. So they attach to these receptors because you're not making enough of your own 2-AG or you're no, enough anandamide or, palma, or PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide. You're not making enough of this on your own, mostly because you don't have the correct nutrients to do it and everybody's under too much oxidative stress and inflammation to do it. So when you take these external ligands that attach to the endocannabinoid receptor, it decreases inflammation, decreases oxidative stress. CBD, the way the molecule is structured, is actually an effective, it'll take an, an um, errant or single unpaired electron and attach it to itself. So it's an awesome antioxidant. It functions almost like vitamin E and vitamin C, but it's a bit stronger. Um, so it'll scavenge these free radicals from oxidative stress that damage the cells and damage proteins and DNA. That's one way it works. THC is similar. THC attaches to the brain endocannabinoid system mostly, and it will decrease the brain's ability to perceive neuropathic pain and other pains. THC is awesome for chronic nerve-based pain. I mean, it's, in my opinion, way more effective than any narcotics and way safer. Um, CBD, similarly. THC and CBD together gives you what's called the entourage effect. So anytime you take plant-based medicine or natural medicine, you got to start thinking of it differently than the way that you're used to thinking about drugs. Drugs started because it's a whole industry of patent-based mass manufacturing of single molecules, okay? You can't patent natural medicine. There's no single molecule in natural medicine. Like, like if you eat basil, you're getting a bunch of phytochemicals, right? 
if you eat an orange, you're not just getting vitamin C, you're getting other phytochemicals. So CBD and THC work well together. They actually work better together than they do apart, if that makes sense. So they enhance each other because they, they have slightly different functionalities in the endocannabinoid system that makes the endocannabinoid system a more effective regulator for you and a more effective antioxidant system, or the CBD is more effective antioxidant. It's kind of a complicated answer, sorry. Uh, if there are any more questions, we will take them now. I did want to mention total ankle replacements. I don't, if you guys, if somebody out there has severe end stage ankle arthritis and you've been told that is not an option, just know that's not true. That is the fastest growing procedure in Medicare nationally because it's so effective. Um, so maybe go seek a second opinion because if your ankle arthritis is that bad that you can't do anything else, all this other stuff we talked about, and you need, someone is telling you you need a fusion, you should at least go get an opinion about a total ankle replacement because it really does make the gait biomechanics much better and people are much more happy after total ankles and after fusions and they actually are more active. Some people actually go back to running after total ankles. So don't forget that. Um, what about the prize? Okay, so share this talk, please, with anybody that you know that has ankle pain or ankle arthritis, and then we're going to pick a winner for the prize. Um, and the prize is the Well Theory PEA, palmitoyl ethanolamide. We talked about that. That acts in a similar fashion to CBD to reduce inflammatory pain around nerve endings. Okay, and then the D3C and quercetin combo, which is extremely great for your health. And guess what else? Your connective tissue and collagen help because all three of those help your collagen line up correctly and cross-link correctly to be a functional tendon or a functional ligament or functional cartilage rather than just a big mass of abnormal proteins or collagen, okay? So you need those three to have a good functioning lymph system or um, white blood cell system to fight off infection, but you also need it to have good tendon health. So the PEA and the D3 quercetin are the immune boost multi are awesome for your immune system, but in my opinion, an orthopedic surgeon, they're great for connective tissue as well and can help with ankle pain. We had another question about knee pain, if something will work well for knee pain. I'm assuming they're talking about natural medicine. Yeah, so my patients with knee pain, I, tell, I try to get them on the, the turmeric, which my turmeric has Piperine, which makes, enhances the bioavailability of the turmeric. It also has PEA, which works for the reasons we already discussed. And then also there's ginger. All of these have been studied for pain and all work well. So I put them all in one combo to, to specific for cartilage pain, which knee pain is one of the primary reasons people go to see orthopedic surgeons. So it works great for that. So I like it when they get on the turmeric, the joint health multi and the tart cherry, because the tart cherry is just been such a game changer in terms of safe pain relief for people. I take it, well, I take all of these every day myself, but the tart cherry is just great. I take it every night because it does have a little bit of melatonin in it, so I don't want that during the day. Um, but the, the basics for knee pain should be turmeric and tart cherry. And, you know, these natural medicine things are awesome because they have the added benefit of promoting cardiac health, cognitive health, reducing cognitive decline because they reduce neuroinflammation. So they have all, a lot of other systemic benefits because they're actually going to the cellular foundational problem of arthritis, which is the same cellular foundation problem of everything, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation. If you could control those, you could control your destiny. That's why I love this stuff. Okay, I guess the same person. Okay, this person that is asking about what to do for knee pain has had two meniscal surgeries where they removed portions of her meniscus, which is the cushion between the femur and the, the shin bone. And she has a Baker cyst, which is really just um, joint fluid that squirts out the back of the knee through a one-way valve through a torn meniscus. So what I tell this person is you need to go get evaluated for alignment issues for tight fascial bands in that kinetic chain. You may need an unloading brace to take weight off of where the meniscus was removed. We know now in orthopedic surgery, the natural history of removing a meniscus is not good. Um, meniscectomy, people that have had meniscectomies versus those that have not, the group that has had meniscectomies has more arthritis, more advanced, quicker with worse outcomes. So 
most people that have had a portion of the meniscus removed um, might have more arthritis than they would otherwise. Now, sometimes the meniscus has to come out. I mean, it is what it is if you have mechanical symptoms or whatever. But we have learned this over time looking at population-based um, outcomes in orthopedic surgery. So if you have had two episodes where parts of your meniscus were removed and you have a Baker cyst, I have to assume that you must have or you probably have some sort of alignment issue because you don't have enough cushion in one side of the knee. So unloading it, physical therapy, anything that can promote cartilage health, um, keeping your weight down mostly to reduce the chronic inflammation that excessive adipose tissue causes, all of that would help. Um, and then you can get your Baker's cyst drain in clinic. You don't have to have surgery for that if, it, if it's problematic. All right, well, hopefully this helped. Wait, we have another question. One more question. You had a PRP for end-stage metatarsal arthritis. I've had two injections, and it does work. How often will I need to have such injections to address the arthritis? This person, they, they say they have end-stage arthritis of the metatarsal phalangeal joint, um, and they've had PRP before, and it works and helps their pain, and they're about to have another one. The question is, how long does this last? Uh, I think probably if it works for you and it starts to fade, like once a year should be enough, if that. If you end stage arthritis, it's hard to get that to regenerate where you don't need more treatment. It's great when you can catch somebody in early stage or like stage one or two arthritis and then hit them with PRP or stem cells or the connective tissue matrix, because then you have a better chance of a more longer uh, or a longer term result or beneficial outcome. The end stage arthritis is a bit more difficult. In those cases, what your goal of treatment really is, is reduced inflammatory burden. So you're just trying to reduce the inflammation and improve pain that way. And the PRP uh, tends to be a six month to a one year, um, I guess, outcome, similar to when you do it for hair loss. So most people that you do one a month, for like two or three months. And then once the hair is stabilized, most people end up needing to do that about every year for maintenance. And then of course, any anything you can do to reduce the oxidative stress on your knee, on your big toe, on your ankle uh, is better for you. So I take as many antioxidants as I can because I'm hoping for optimal aging. I mean, I'm hoping I'll be hiking when I'm 100. But so vitamin C, vitamin E, tart cherry, CBD, quercetin, all of these things are antioxidants. Eat as many colorful fruits and vegetables as you can. Um, really eat as many fruits and vegetables as you can and try to limit inflammatory things. Like don't add to the inflammation you already have. So I try to avoid red meat, try to avoid processed foods, try to avoid anything with advanced glycation end products, try to avoid hyperglycemia or, you know, try not to have high blood sugar at, if at all possible. I'll just avoid anything pro-inflammatory and eat a lot of anti-inflammatory foods and you will feel better. And that's it. So thanks for joining us on a Saturday morning. And uh, I guess we'll have another talk in about a month. And I'm not sure what that topic is off the top of my head. Diet and exercise, my favorite topic. All right. So we'll see you in a month and uh, Merry Christmas.